Hey there, and welcome back to the Bold Inventors Show. I'm your host, J.D. Hoovner, with my trusty co-host, Matt Colseth. How do you do? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. It's a wonderful sunny day. Not too hot up here. I hear a lot of people whining about temperatures all around. We're like comfortable 80s, like it's yeah. down the middle. Are you good out there? Yeah, I'm, I'm better than I deserve. It's, uh, I don't know, upper 70s, lower 80s here. It's gorgeous here in Minnesota. So Lovely. Well, I hope all of you listeners are out there um, are in a good spot and uh, enjoying the summer. This is our inventor show. If this is the first time tuning in, we're, we're here for you, the inventor, entrepreneur, business owner. We're going to be talking about patents today, uh, but we'll take any questions with respect to patents, trademarks, intellectual property, which could cover copyright, trade secret even. Uh, don't give up any secrets. As, as always, I'm going to put a legal notice here. By nature of you joining this, um, call it a video podcast or play the audio on the podcast side, you are not a client, unfortunately, and uh, there's no client attorney privilege here. So please keep anything that is not yet protected confidential. If you have any specific questions, we'll provide a link here for you to schedule time with us um, to do just that. Uh, Matt, today we've got a, a special guest. that you, you met him just really briefly. Uh, he's hanging out backstage. He's another patent attorney. So yeah, he's a good-looking gentleman, too. Oh, there you go. Three attorneys. This is going to be awesome. Uh, riveting, right? Uh, but I trust this guy does entertain. Um, he actually has his own YouTube channel, and I am modeling. I am trying to keep up with him. So I'm excited to bring him on and have him share his uh, journey, talk about his firm a bit. Um, and then we'll we'll go to our, as always, our bold bite. Matt, I've got a really good one for you. Uh, nice. Right I'm ready. Um, this was just cracking me up. I was like, yes. So um, we'll enjoy that. We'll make sure we budget at least 10 to 15 minutes for that. Okay. So, so here's the link for everybody out there. Um, we are going to give you a copy of this book behind me, Bold Ideas, The Inventor's Guide to Patents. If you do, go ahead and schedule a time to just chat with us free of charge uh, to see if now is the time to move forward. If you have questions about what you're working on and you want to have a confidential discussion, this is the time to do it. We do welcome any live questions. Please, please bring it on. Um, I want to make sure you guys have the time. You spent some time here. You're coming in in, in person, live. You're gonna, we're going to put you to the front of the line. Um, we have two preloaded questions from Avo, so if we don't get any live questions, we will go to those. Okay, let's bring on... Dylan Adams, welcome to the hey. show. What up, How's Dylan? Going? Thanks for having me. Good to be Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so so, so yeah. the audience members know Dylan is in front of uh, a library of books, just painting the picture. You're painting the scenery. So it's Dylan, a full, it's a full it's copy Dylan. of the United States Code, actually. I think patents are right here. That's 35 USC. I, I got it like at uh, an old law school. They were selling it because they didn't need it anymore because everything is digital. I was like, yeah, hey, I mean, it's like the best backup back up. ever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not one of those fake attorney ones either, right? Where he's on the green screen. No, it's this no, is yeah, it's screen. actually real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, to confirm that, Dylan, we need you to do a quick head shake and we're <laughs> for any blur. Now that's incredible, yeah. sir. No, that, that is, is a, that is an actual library. Um, excellent. Well, so please bring on those questions. This is the day to do it. You've got two for the price of one in terms of patent law. Um, okay, Dylan, give us a little background on yourself. If you don't mind, take us back. How did you decide patent law was going to be your area of law and expertise? And maybe we're, bring us up to current day uh, with, with where you're at and how you're serving inventors. Yeah, it was kind of a, a circuitous route to where I was. I, I was in college doing a biochem degree and actually took some time off in the middle of that joined a band to an up and down the West coast um, for, for two, three years. And was like a full-time musician. Like we had a band house and everything, cut an album and, you know, did music videos and stuff. And, you know, in doing that, I realized I really want to do business. And so when that band thing eventually kind of crumbled because the, the label had a ton of money, but didn't really know what to do with it. I went back to school, finished my biochem degree and then realized, Hey, I want to go to law school so I can get into business get to law school and some, someone said, hey, you have a technical background. You should uh, you, you should sit for the patent bar because you have this biochem degree. So sat for the patent bar and then like quickly. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Someone yeah. just said, hey, you should do this. And then you're like, hey, I'm going to go. I mean, what was there? Yeah, some, it, it, like, it was totally a cute girl who said that, by the way. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, some cute girl at a job fair said, hey, you, you should get into patent. I was like, OK, whatever you say. Whatever you say. No, it, it, it just kind of happened to come along that, you know, somebody said, oh, you should take this patent bar thing of technical background. I looked in, I was like, oh, this looks kind of fun, actually. You know, I want to be able to use my technical background in addition to be, being able to do business. That seemed like a good fit. So I took the patent bar and then people started to refer me clients. I started, started my own uh, solo firm. Another guy in law school, he found out that I was doing this. And so we started a, a firm together. And we had offices like downtown Seattle in the Columbia Tower. 
We always said that we were we are the highest uh, patent firm in the country uh, for a while. You can take that a couple different ways, Dylan. Yeah, exactly. That's why we kind of like toned down that marketing as it started to become legal in Seattle. Yeah, kind of kind of got the wrong impression a lot. Right, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> got it. But yeah, so we did, did that for a while, and then ended up that firm ended up breaking up because there was issues with attorney non-attorney profit sharing because we were both agents. He graduated, became an attorney, and then I moved my uh, my my practice into a small boutique firm into another boutique firm but then ended up getting uh, kind of realized well kind of kind of realized you know I'm not getting a lot of traction with my biochem background I was doing a lot of software stuff a lot of people you know really just wouldn't you know give me you know give me job opportunities or really you know I wasn't able to get traction with just biochem degree so I went back to school got a master's in electrical engineering at UW and then got this opportunity to kind of start the patent practice at this huge firm, the, the Seattle office. So, you know, this huge thousand person attorney firm from having, you know, small boutique firms started my, uh, the patent practice there. And then eventually realized, you know, I wasn't really going to be able to make partner doing that. And then I transferred my practice to here to Davis Wright Tremaine and have been here ever since and plan to be here, uh, you know, as, as long as they'll, they'll have me. That is awesome. Well, I mean, so you have, you've done a lot. You've done a lot. You started your own firm. You went to the mega firm. Now you're yeah. at, would you call it a medium-sized firm at Davis, right? Tremaine? It's still Amlaw 100. We have around 700 attorneys, offices from Anchorage to LA, uh, Chicago, DC, New York. So we're still pretty big, um, but not as massive as uh, as some firms. We're still, you know, one of those Amlaw 100 kind of kind of firms. Right. But I, I, I definitely give the you know the, the small you know the small the small firm feel still because that's kind of my background and where my my ethos is totally. Jay and I can't even wrap our heads around a firm that size. You know, <laughs> I, I externed at a big firm, right? But like, that's crazy to me. Like that. There's, I have a hard time understanding it myself. Yeah, I, I, I'm very like I just I, I just sit with all the patent nerds and we hang out and nerd out on patents. And every once I talk to intellectual property people, but I, it, yeah, it's it's hard to sort of fathom how big a firm like that is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay, Dylan, I've got to plug your YouTube channel and, and the content you're putting up. I mean, you said patent nerd. I mean, this, this look, you're laying it all out. I tried, but man, you have been crushing it. So patents demystified. Now, this was a book you published, right? That's kind of the the, 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 the start of this? Correct. Yeah. So it started out as a book, you know, there, there's, you know, and this was before you published all, all your great books was there was really no book out there that really told people how to actually do patents correctly for startups and entrepreneurs. Right. There's like, there's patent yourself, which, as you know, is not a good idea. And there's a lot of books on patent law, which has too much detail, which really isn't relevant to folks. And so I decided, hey, I want to write this book. And it ended up being a decent success. Uh, yeah. You know, was, you know, be using like top universities like Harvard, Stanford, MIT as an official patent guide of the American Bar Association. So I kind of got lucky with that. And then, you know, and, and you know, and your books are kind of the same thing. They're they're awesome resources as well. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a quick share. So this is the uh, I'll, I'll share screens. You've got a, a, a couple of videos you've done recently. Um, you know, these are uh, how to patent an idea. This is a, a couple of years ago. But I mean, just a matter of a few months ago, you've you've done you know, secrets of how patents can get approved. Um, let me just, I, I've got to share a screen here just so people can see, and then I'll put a link in here as well. Uh, so let me share here. Here we go. Hopefully this, this is you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that is me. I, I try to keep consistent branding. That, that's kind of what the book lo looks like as well. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's great. The, the topics are excellent. Um, and, and I've, I listened to a few of these videos and I would highly recommend any inventor listening here to go check this out. Is a great resource to go to. Uh, I'll put this link here in the in the in the comments. Hmm. Uh, so what have you seen? You know, what, what sort of drives you to to make these videos, right? What, what is what is sort of your you know passion there? Yeah, it's a couple of things. One is I just think it's going to be really important long term to be able to communicate via video. That's why I'm so impressed by all the stuff that you've been doing. And you know, you talk about you know you know using my channel as a model. I've been using your stuff as a model as well. You know, for for a long time. You know, for and so. You know, just being able to communicate well via video, I think that's going to be really important. Learning how to produce the videos, things like lighting, cameras, editing, um, all those sort of things. I just want to be able to learn that. But then also, too, is I really want to give back to the startup community. I mean, honestly, you'll, you'll probably see in a lot of videos where I say, like, hey, you know, because I talk about how to pick a patent attorney, these things like 
I don't want this to be biased. So I'm just going to say, I will not even, you know, represent you. If you contact me about this video, it's about giving back to the startup community and giving people tools to succeed. You know, and I think that you see, you probably see that a lot where there's a lot of bad information out there and people need a lot of help at, at early stages. And the more information that folks like us can give them, the better. I just think that, you know, the startup community needs a lot of help and, you know, it, the more that we can do to, to, to promote that, the better. Awesome. awesome. You know, go ahead, Matt. No, I was just going to say, I'm in it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Hey, let, let's just cut to it. So I, I, I reached out to Dylan and say, Dylan, dude, your, your page is blowing up. You're doing a lot of great content. Um, you must be landing a lot of clients, right? And, and so, I mean, Dylan, you can answer that. I mean, are, are you looking to bring in clients? And what do you tell solo inventors that are looking to, to, to try to hire you to, to do this kind of work? Yeah. So as far as my practice goes, like I represent clients from garage inventors to startups, to Shark Tank companies, to Fortune 100 companies. But what I really love to do is work with startups and inventors. That's, that's what I enjoy the most. But as far as like for the YouTube channel, honestly, I'm not really looking to get clients out of uh, out of it. It's not the main driver. If anything, it's sort of to, you know, to give resources to my existing clients. Like, for instance, I give a copy of my book to every one of my clients and then say, oh, hey, this is going on. Read this chapter, read these pages or, hey, this is going on. Here's a video or two about, you know, how to understand it so that people can, you know, spend their money on substantive things with me instead of patent basics. As much as I obviously love teaching patent basics, I want to give people those tools cost effectively. And that's kind of, you know, giving them a library of videos and then also my book as well. Love it. Love it. Um, let's see. I'm going to go to um, our our two questions here. Came in from Avo. These are these are trademark related, but perhaps there's some some patent pieces here as well. Uh, and then we're going to critique our our Shark Tank in for the bold bite. So this first question is it's out of Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. Haven't been there in a while. I've heard of it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Writing a book. Writing a book. I'll put it in. Put it up here. Writing a book named My, Me. Big fat Mexican quinceañera. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but I'm worried about the move in my big fat Greek wedding. I just want to make sure there is no trademark using my big fat, <laughs> since there's already a movie that has that in its name. Maybe some copyright trademark mix here. Matt, can you take this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, this um, so this is both. It, it is a trademark question in some regards, but it's mostly a copyright question. So when it comes to branding or securing ownership of a book title it actually falls under copyright law and so you can't trademark a single title of a book per se like my big fat wedding now if you have a series of books or a series of articles called my big fat greek wedding or whatever it is right you can title you can register that as a federal trademark but generally speaking the content and clean the title of the book falls under u.s copyright law um you'd have to look at the USPTO's database to see if anything's registered under my big fat wedding or basically the translation of the Spanish into English uh, for me, big fat Mexican quinceañera. I, I have no idea what that means. But it's, a no age, uh, it's a coming of age celebration for, for uh, young women. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yes yeah, so you translate that to English, whatever that turns out to be. <laughs> and you look to see if there's anything similar um, in the you probably look at a couple different categories. You'd look at the book category or the, the printed materials category, and you'd also look at probably the entertainment category at the USPTOs. And if nothing's registered, then you you know you probably call an attorney and make sure that it is actually good to go and, and file it. Got it. Got it. So kind of a, a, a big fat it depends, but yeah, that's that's your standard. Uh, well, I mean, you get what you pay for with this podcast. Money back guarantee. Boom. And actually, we got we got David Bosland out of Seattle area. I don't know if you know David Dylan. Uh, tough to get any copyright protection on titles of works. Chapter Correct. Eight, so. Yep. So you could copyright on the whole work, right? Yep. Including the title. But like David said, you're not going to be able to. You got backup on that, Matt. That's awesome. Dylan, anything to add on your end? Thoughts? I think the only thing would be, you know, for instance, on the copyright side of things, you know, obviously there it's a big fat um, quinceanera, but they would want to make sure that it's not copying the big fat Greek, Greek wedding movie because, you know, that could be considered a derivative work. Matt, you could probably speak to that. I, I know bits about copyright, but in a lot of ways, you know, you, you probably know a lot more than I do. Yeah, I mean, derivative work is a great example. That basically means that um, you know, that Big Fat Greek, Greek, Greek Wedding, whoever owns that, could conceivably go into this category, right? You're basically it, potentially interfering with, with their revenue stream, right? And if you're doing that, or there's a possibility for that, then you're in violation of U.S. copyright law. 
Yeah. Our guys Not only that the story is the same, and if and at the same time, even you know, sometimes a lot of those stories are going to be sort of just generic. I think it's, yes. it's isn't it scenes affair that they call it, where it's like these general scenes about weddings and things. So you know, maybe there'll be some themes of weddings or you know, or, or, or quinceañeras or parties or whatever, and that maybe not be uh, copyright protection. But yeah, something like that might be good to talk to a copyright attorney about. You know, hey, how close is this? Are there any issues? Here we go, guys. Number two, fast action. LC partner. Oh, here, here we go. Let me go up to the top. Yeah. So registered a trademark with his name in it without our permission. Uh, we have an LLC partnership split three ways, two majority holders and one minority holder investor. This person registered a trademark with his name in it, which he never had permission to do so. We're continuing to open more locations with their same business name. Will he be able to claim ownership of those entities or claim profits? Also, <laughs> it also takes it, take him to court to remove him from the mark. Yeah, I see this one a lot. I see this one a lot. Okay. So um, you were a couple of different thought processes here, right? You know, one, this is an innocent mistake, right? And what's a mistake? The, that he that the partner of this LLC filed the trademark with him owning the trademark. Okay. Okay. As opposed to either him and the two other business partners listed as co-owners on the trademark, or better, having the LLC own the trademark application at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So we're gonna say it's like maybe potentially just a you know innocent mistake uh likely not likely someone he filed the trademark wanting to own the trademark as leverage if things don't you know go sideways in the future it's typically what i see uh but um the thing to do here would be to obviously talk to him about it and get him to um you know basically uh assign the trademark to the correct entity which is the llc if he doesn't there's a good argument that uh, he filed the trademark under false pretense, right? That he's not actually the lawful owner of the trademark, that he doesn't have priority or actual use of the trademark that the LLC does. Uh, and as such, is subject to cancellation by the LLC, which he's co-partner of. So. Got it. Got it. That was awesome, Matt, sir. Thanks. I I, uh, I, I really hydrated this morning. That was excellent. So, <laughs> so, so the, the entity can actually own the trademark, right? Is that it should. I mean, that's, you know, that's the way that I like to do it. Keeps things clean. So yeah, it's not under the individual name. Yeah, because if it's under the individual's name, um, you know, theoretically, not theoretically, in actuality, then you would need to license the name back to the LLC if the LLC is using it, right? And, you know, if you don't have that agreement in place, that's, you know, that's not actual technical use, right? So there's, a, I see a lot of reasons why you don't want to own it as an individual and have your company run the business because more often than not, there's no agreement between the, the individual and the LLC about who owns the trademark and who's licensing it for what price, essentially. Very, very good. All right, guys, we got just 13 minutes left. We're going to go to our bold bite. Are you ready? Let's Dude, do this. No, I'm ready. Because I've been keeping you both in the dark. Bev <laughs> Buckle. Bev Buckle. Bev right. Buckle. Let's do it. Uh, how's the audio coming through? T test on that. You hear that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Here we go. Hello. My name is Jay Kreiner, and my product and business is the Bev Buckle. I am seeking $50,000 in exchange for 10% equity in my business. The bed buckle is one of the most interesting inventions America has ever seen. Picture this, you're on a sporting event, a concert, fishing out the river, and you feel the need to free up your hands of your beverage. Well, bam! Oh my God. Oh, oh my God. man. <laughs> oh, that is a great idea. It's the only buckle on the market that can fold out to hold your beverage. Did Christmas come early? Yes, it did. <laughs> Everyone knows someone who would want one. I can design the faceplate to have any brand, All right, guys. any logo, and any Let color. Let your feedback Licensing, on that. Branding. Right So there. keep that cold beverage close and those hands free. So um, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to Matt first. Bev Buckle. All right. Bev Buckle. Well, a couple different thought processes here. So um, one, the name in my mind, I mean, you tell me your product's called Bev Buckle. I know exactly what that is, which is always a red flag, right? I'm thinking merely descriptive. You know, what's wrong with that? Walk me through it. What's wrong with that? Yeah. So if a consumer can instantly identify what the product is based on the name, right, without any use of imagination, then the trademark is what we would call merely descriptive, meaning that uh, there's no 
imagination needed to connect the product or the service to the mind of the consumer. So in this case, like belt buckle, I'm like, man, this this is one of two things in my my world. This is a this is a buck, you know, belt buckle that holds a beverage, or like it's a belt buckle that can open a bottle, right? It's one of the two. It's it can't be anything else, and it is what it is. So it's it's descriptive. Um, so the USPTO, I'm looking really quickly at the applications here. Like one minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they Good registered, way. but they registered because they filed what's called a 2F amendment to their application or a 2F application, meaning that they've been in use for at least five years and they can attest that they're the only ones using this product name and people have come to know them as the source for these beverage belt buckles. So they got the registration with the caveat that it's only because they've been using it for five years continuously. That is awesome. That is a cool example of sort of that secondary meaning. Is that what that yeah, is? Yeah, that, that can save a lot of clients, especially clients obviously that have been around for a while and they might have a pretty descriptive trademark. We can sometimes finagle it so that we can get through the application process with the descriptive trademark using a 2F claim. Right on. When he said invention, he went on and later in the presentation and did say he had a patent. Um, he wasn't lying. He was lying. Let me just show that off real quick and get patent nerdy a bit. Um, they do have his U.S. patent granted in 2012, so a while ago. Oh, nice. He actually used the term patent correctly because a lot yeah. of times they just say, I have a patent. And it's like, well, you have a provisional patent application or maybe you filed a non-provisional application. That's one of my favorite things that also just grinds my gears. It's one of my <laughs> the truth is you're actually probably right. During the film, this may have been a 2009 or 2010 pitch to the yeah. Sharks, and it was still pending. He didn't know that he would actually get to the finish line. Uh, but he did. In 2008, you can see down here, he filed a provisional. Yep. Okay, you find that kind of there in smaller print. Um, so he's got 20 years, correct if I'm wrong, from that date, from the 2009 date. So it's still in force until 2028 or 2029. Um, and it isn't just on the, the way that it looks. He, they got a utility patent. And you know, a brief look. Uh, Dylan, I'd love to get your feedback, actually. Uh, you got to scroll to the bottom to see what indeed they actually own, right? Uh, it's a buckle. Darn buckle is the device claim looks like they've got, you got to have a back plate, a fastener, a front plate, a single hinge and a stop. Sounds like some parts and pieces. So, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's good to see a, you know, a structural claim looks like a, a yeah, it's good they were able to get claims on the actual device itself. So that's gonna that's gonna be good in terms of infringement. So what yeah. one thing I was gonna say, you know, if it, if it was something that you know hadn't been filed on yet, I say, hey, you know, you'd want to think about a couple of things. One is filing on the, the the device itself. But if that's gonna be difficult, a lot of times it can be good to file on a method of use because that's it can be a lot harder to find prior art on the method of actually using something. Because if you just have that thing, the you know, examiner's gonna say, well, it doesn't matter whether this is on a belt buckle or not. What really matters is you know, this specific thing and could look at just general drink holders, like in a car or something, right? <laughs> yeah, right. And that's always a problem, you know? So it's like, you know, you, it, it can be helpful to go in with, with method claims, say, you know, a method of using and, you know, putting on a belt and then how you, you know, uncouple, you know, uh, you know, uh, undo it and put a bottle in it. It's going to be a lot harder for an examiner to reject something like that. So that could be a sort of a way to, you know, guarantee or, you know, get closer to guarantee getting some of the issue, but it's awesome they would get uh, system claims on this. Right. Yeah, and David, I think is on point here. You know, a lot of these folks pitching on Shark Tank, it's a it's a single product, and they're trying to call it a business. I think that yeah. may be one of the issues. And they did talk about sales. He was able to sell four thousand dollars worth of the product before pitching to the sharks. Um, they went back and forth. Barbara actually said she would put in fifty thousand for fifty one percent. Okay, um, but after kind of behind closed doors, she ended up backing out. Perhaps after doing some diligence. Um, the huge upside good news is that they're selling a million dollars worth of these every year. Wow. Um, they're listed. They have their own website. They're on Amazon. Um, I was blown away. So this is, yeah, it's, this is one of those novelty products. I, I have a couple of clients like this that sell something kind actually they're, they're beverage related and they kill it on these products. There's the America. I mean, that you can just see the logo. So, um, Having a utility patent like that, it uh, you're not limited in terms of what types of designs to put on there. Um, you know the, the way that it, the ornamentation, right? It's it's not, you're not locked in. It's just the functional term that has those four or five elements that we talked about. Um, any competitor or infringer will be unable to right um, use that.
put that into the market. So, um, JD, when, when does this patent expire? When are you and I going to get in on this bev buckle? Yeah. You know, to, to wait a few more years. Look like 2028 or 2029. I don't right, know. I'll, I'll be ready. I'll be ready. It's, it's on my ca Outlook calendar now. I'm ready. <laughs> You got some ideas that have a little spinner on there or something, have a like multiple. Like, you no, know, I'm do the exact same thing. I'm going to just reverse engineer it. Wine tastings. I mean, <laughs> it needs more light and bling. That's what I'm talking about. Sorry, so. the, one more really fun update. Mm -hmm. so they kind of got to that popularity because of two things. They were featured in a German Playboy magazine shoot. <laughs> <laughs> you could just say what. And wow. then they did get, uh, they were featured vendor at the Daytona 500. Nice. Okay, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to copy the exact, exact same product, but we're going to put an alarm on it. So when your beverage is low, the alarm goes off to remind you to go get another one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's what we're going to do. Let's do it. The whole Playboy thing kind of concerns me that they weren't putting bottles in that thing for, for that. That 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 may be a little uh, interesting. Right. Yeah, right. See, it would mess with your method of use, right? But the, the yeah, right. Oh, yeah, not infringing. You're putting things aside from beverages in there. Right, we're going to workshop this together. We're going to make hundreds of dollars. Okay, David's already thinking litigation. Someone's going <laughs> to bust a spleen on a bottle. You're, yeah, David, very wise. Okay, so yeah, make sure they have lots of waivers. Uh, but I, I see this being yeah, kind of those novelty things. It's pretty fun. It's simple. Um, and you yeah, this is you know every Christmas that you know your drunkle gets out and he's got his you know he's he's ready to roll. You know this is what he brings every year. Absolutely. All right. So um, yeah, so that's the update on that one, um, Matt. What I want to do is have you. Um, if you give us a, I don't dance. I can't dance. No, I want to. I want to. Want to. See what's going to go to. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Of course, on your product, you. I, I keep putting a tiger tail. Yeah. Uh, what's the update on that? You were saying you're going to go through a sale. So yeah. So we have a purchase agreement in place. So for those who don't know, which is probably most folks, I own. I co-own uh, a dog gear manufacturing business called Tiger Tail. And we manufacture dog leashes and dog collars, all American made products, really kind of high end stuff. And we've had that for the last three years, mostly selling on Amazon. And uh, we were just recently purchased. So, yeah, awesome. that's awesome. Man. Yeah, we, uh, we have a purchase agreement in place. Um, we just shipped out all the existing inventory from our warehouse on Monday. And um, we're in the process of transitioning everything over from digital marketing standpoint, um, all the digital assets, um, getting the LLC transferred over to the new ownership. So um, I'm hoping that's done by the end of this week. And, and then I'm going to retire, you know, and just, you know, no, no I'm and not. So is it a full sale? Are they going to keep you around for consulting or anything like that? Or is it you're totally out and can start on the next thing? Yeah. So there's obviously a non-compete agreement in place as part of the deal, five years, something like that, yeah. that which line I'm not going to get back to the, the dog gear business again anytime soon. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll be required to have like some, you know, amount of hours as consultants on the business for the foreseeable future as part of the deal. Um, Can you say who or is it still confidential? What's that? Can you say who you sold to? No. Okay. All right. All not right. Yet. Not yet. But uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not retiring JD. So don't, don't worry. I will be paying off my law school loans. How's that? <laughs> that's amazing, Matt. So, Seriously, you're right, Steve. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's awesome. You have done it. You've done a lot of, you know, folks are that are listening are hoping to do. Um, in the last couple minutes here, I, would you please plug how your intellectual property played a role, maybe not the most pivotal, but a role in helping you get to where you are now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. So this whole brand for Tiger Tail actually like occurred to me or came to me and my business partner. Um, and we did a lot of due diligence in terms of the, what we're going to call it, why we're going to call it that, if the name was available from a trademark registration perspective, the product that we actually came up with itself, you know, we went and had, you know, the attorneys at Bold IP file the uh, design patent for us. Um, but yeah, it became a huge part of like our identity and we did everything kind of by the book when it came to offering new products, um, you know, trademarking each of those product lines as we, we rolled them out. And, you know, that was part of the sale as well, is that we negotiated around the intellectual property of the company. Right. And so that intellectual property went with the company and it was specifically asked about by the purchasers. How many years were you selling? How, you know, had you been selling? Three. That's it. Do you ever see any ripoffs? Anybody copycat? Uh, we were getting there for sure. So okay. one of the one of the things that our product did that was really unique is we used a, a very cool clasp. It's called a scissor snap or a lobster clasp. And you had typically only seen those on like firefighter 
you know, um, products and, and things like that. But we used it on a dog leash and uh, it kind of caught on like wildfire. And so you see a lot of high end leashes now using that scissor snap. So that wasn't a violation of our product per se, or and certainly not our design patent, but we could tell that the market had reacted to what we were doing and was playing catch up. David's on fire. I'm going to put him in on, on comments here. Was the IP owned by the company or you individually, Matt? Uh, or another, the other company. Sometimes we have a company that is the IP. Oh, that's uh, right. That's what he's asking. That's right. IP so no, we just had the LLC own everything, assets, IP, et cetera. Okay. Nice. Okay. Very and good. what's the benefit of having the separate company own the IP? Licensing, right? So that when you sell the business, you don't necessarily sell the IP along with it, right? So exactly. you, can do, you can have like an IP close or, you know, warehouse essentially with all these different brands owned by, you know, a company and then license the names out if you're not actually manufacturing them yourself. Yep. Perfect. All right, guys, we're at the end of our half hour. Dylan, thank you so much for coming on and being a great guest of ours. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Absolutely. This guy, this guy pants. For sure. <laughs> I'm actually going to be interviewing him on our Bold Lawyers show, quick plug here in a couple of weeks. So we're going to get to find out a bit more behind the scenes and how he works with the clients and you know some of the tips and tricks. If you're an, an attorney out there, uh, patent or IP attorney, you want to hear more about Dylan and, and uh, behind the scenes, how we get stuff done. Listen for that. Um, thank you. all. Thank you, David, for your comments. I appreciate you and everyone else out there. We'll be here live next week, Wednesday. We're here every week at 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 East Coast. For Bold Patents and for, for Dylan and Matt, Wish you guys a great rest of your week.